Part 3. Agricultural Reform and the Origin of Environmentalism While the secretive world of George Buchan of Kello and the extent of his family network appears to have been missed in the historical accounts of agricultural development in the mid-18th century, the shift in East Lothian society can also be assessed in the life of Andrew White and in his report on the present state of husbandry published in 1778 when he said on page 275, In the course of surveying East Lothian, I have discovered that improvements in agriculture are chiefly owing to the tenants, the gentlemen a few in number, who apply themselves to agriculture. My last visit to the National Library of Scotland before the pandemic was made on the 18th of December 2019. I had asked to see Volume 2 of a treatise in agriculture by the Reverend Adam Dixon, which had been first published in 1762. He was minister at Duns between 1750 until 1770, when he became minister at Whittingham until he died in 1776 after a fall from his horse, I wanted to assess his influence, if any, on farming practices in his new parish. To my surprise, the opening chapter said, Nothing has more retarded the progress of agriculture than the attempts that have been made to introduce general schemes without regard to the climate. Without a knowledge of the climate, no proper schemes of management can be formed, nor improvement made. He then gave detailed comments on the growing of at least 20 crops, and finally, after 451 pages, he concluded, The only certain road to improvement is by experiment and observations. The Reverend Adam Dixon was a member of the Select Society at the time of the Enlightenment. This was before the era of Sir John Sinclair and the lives of four of the East Linton reformers, the exception being Andrew Meikle. It is almost certain that he had discussions with George Buchan of Kello and his grandson, Sir George Buchan Hibbon. In her book on Jacobite Estates of the Forty-Five, Annette Smith looks at the hopes of the commissioners appointed under the Annexing Act of 1747 to pursue two important potential sources of economic development, namely fishing and working minerals. She concludes that the results can hardly be described as very valuable, and that included work by a James Robertson to provide the key to types of vegetation and soils. She then concludes, again, that the significance of these searches lay not in the results, but in the illumination they cast on those who have planned the annexation, and on the type of men to whom the administration was entrusted. They were lively, curious and inquisitive, and prepared to experiment. It is that spirit that can be found in the surveys of Sinclair's surveyors written for his county reports. Alexander Lowe, in his 1794 publication on the means of improvement in Berwickshire, records on page 9, the examples of improving by enclosing, marking, liming, etc., having been given in the country by the men and gentlemen and farmers, were seen by all who were devoid of prejudice, and the example was followed, followed by as fast as circumstances could allow. In February 1847, Sir David Baird 
the second baronet of Newbyth, learned that the House of Lords had ruled that he could not sell or improve more than the manor places of his estates at Newbyth and Gilmerton in Edinburgh. The details of that decision were reported in the Scotsman of 10th March 1847. And the background can be found in my article on the life of Sir David, published in the Transactions of the East Lothian Antiquarian Society, Volume 21. This legal decision was based on the terms of a deed of entail, executed by Sir John Baird, his ancestor, in August 1737. Entails were seen as one of the greatest obstacles to the improvement of land. That was the reason why many of the recommendations of the East Linton surveyors could not be delivered, and the cause of the friction over the West Riding report. Was this feudal legacy known to Alexander Law in relation to his report on Berwickshire? Why did the restrictions last so long? In 2012, a Thomas Huxley published an account on Thomas Graham and his Perthshire estates and allocated eight pages to the topic. In essence, there were limitations on what a owner could do with his inherited estate. An Act of 1914 eventually prohibited making new entails. A copy of that book is now held by the Reference Library at Papal Heritage Centre. Within the graveyard at Preston Kirk there is a memorial to a James Hebborn farm manager at Smeaton before his death in 1888. His family origins show that he was brought up in Spring Gardens on Newbyth Estate with a family history that suggests having to relocate after a change in Hebborn ownership of land in the early 18th century, probably in the Humby Keith area of the county. At the time of the first national census in Scotland in 1841, he and his wife, Sibella, were living in the Smeaton Mansion House in the parish of Preston Kirk, presumably while Sir Thomas Buck and Hibbon was absent. They were married in November 1840. James was then resident in the Berwickshire area at Kellow House which was bought by George Buchan 100 years earlier, in 1730. In 2013, the residents of Smeaton House in New South Wales celebrated the foundation of their settlement 175 years ago. And in the words of the editor of the Smeaton Independent, their Captain Hebborn was responsible for the colony's most productive breadbasket on this side of the planet. It is an example of the agricultural knowledge exported to another part of the world. Another link with the Kello estate was the father of Robert Fortune, described as a hedger on the estate. This was the childhood home of the noted plant collector, Robert Fortune, born in 1812. At the entrance to Smeaton Arboretum, there is an example of a tree introduced to the United Kingdom by Robert Fortune. Because of its special position, it suggests that it was planted to mark a link with Fortune's later status as one of the significant plant explorers of his era. Was it a deliberate attempt to see how the Japanese cedar, Cryptomeria japonica, would acclimatise? It was introduced to the UK by Robert Fortune in 1849. 
In 2013, Frederick Albritton Johnson, Assistant Professor of British History at the University of Chicago, published a book on Enlightenment's Frontier. It has been described as a work of environmental, intellectual and social history that will change historical understanding of 18th century Scotland. It is not possible to do justice to Johnson's wide understanding of climate-based experiments with plants and animals and the followers of banks who supported a strategy to distribute and trial transplants across the British Empire. While Sinclair's priority was internal improvement in the United Kingdom. We are now in the middle of assessing the effects of climate change on our environment. I have been experimenting with plants in my garden in Islinton for the past six years. Climate change is already here in the increased examples of extreme weather, the earlier flowering of plants such as wisteria, the increased prevalence of woolly aphid in cod and apples in the garden, and the length of flowering of plants like this yucca, a photo taken in December 2021. Here is an extract of a letter from a friend in Auckland, New Zealand, received on the 6th of July, 2022. I have noticed over the past two years that the trees are growing significantly quicker. Even the native trees that are reputed to be slow growing are no longer slower than the introduced species. We have a series of aerial photos since we moved here, and the differences are remarkable. The tree cover near the front boundary is making me consider more changes to the box hedges and grassed areas. I may remove the box and plant more natives to extend the bush between the road and the rose garden. Our real winter only lasts four to six weeks, from mid-July to mid-August. The rest of the official winter is more like warm UK late autumn and an early UK spring. We haven't had a frost for maybe six years, but lower down around Pukakohe, to the south of Auckland, they get perhaps two or three light frosts. In 1883, David Murray, writing on the commission of forfeited estates, noted, Wheat as a crop was hardly known in the great estates, and only one was it raised, and that was at Trinent, adding that the potato was not grown even in the garden. These two comments illustrate the extent of the significant agricultural and horticultural development over 300 years. The task now is to adapt to a changing world and manage the consequences of the failure to care for our environment. Time is running out. The final slide has a very simple message using a photograph taken at Kew Gardens in 2011. The message is in the picture and time is running out. End of presentation.